Kamusta? How are you doing right now? Maybe you are saying, uh, well, we are doing great. You know, or some of you are saying that you are able to hold up. And some of you are actually saying that things can be better. Right? I know that um, it's already August and uh, we're still, you know, in lockdown for some of you. Right? For us here in New York, uh, we, we are getting out of this, and, but we have to really be careful too. We need to be vigilant. Right? So uh, we still practice the things that we need to do. Wash your hands, wear masks, right? um, practice social distancing. And um, we are already looking forward uh, to meeting in person. And that's why the way we are doing things, we are already transitioning to that. But some of you actually, you were able to hold up so well, but right now you are getting frustrated, right? And somehow you are saying, will there be no let up, right? And uh, right now what you're seeing uh, moving forward is trouble, trouble, trouble. Well, I want to tell you that you are not alone. And today we are going to talk about that in today's message. Um, we are still on our series, Onward. Mainit na pagbati po. Ako po si Pastor Ronald Ramirez. I am Pastor Ronald Ramirez. Warm greetings from Lightcast Church International here in New York. Mabuhay. And again, we would like to um, invite you to like our page and then um, like this post and then tag your friends, comment where you are watching from or where you are joining from and then share, share a live stream, share the blessing. And I hope that today we are going to be a blessing to all of you. Right? In, a, um, in 1 Kings chapter 19, and let me read. In 1 Kings chapter 19, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. So the story that we are going to see today is about the most popular prophet, right? Elijah, in the Old Testament. And also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel, Jezebel is a, the queen, the wife of Ahab, who is the king, sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of them by tomorrow about this time. The meaning of that, because the backstory about this is that Elijah had a showdown against the, the prophets of Baal, right, to whom... Jezebel and Ahab worship, right, um, during the time. And um, during the showdown, during the showdown, the showdown was about they're going to make sacrifices and they're going to call the fire from heaven. And whoever gets the fire to go down, they are going to be, you know, proving who's God is real. And, but the punishment for that, the deal with that, if they're, the God of the other was, wasn't real, proven that it wasn't real. They are going to be killed, or Elijah is going to be killed. So, so that's the backstory there. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life, and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. In verse 4, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die, and said, It is enough now, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my fathers. That's what he said. And remember that during this time, this actually puzzled him because he just came from a victory. You know what happened? The 450 um, prophets of Baal or priests of Baal were all killed. After that, Israel had seen, their eyes were opened, that the real God is the God of Israel. The God of uh, their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Right, so, um, so what happened here? What happened here? The queen threatened Eliza that is going to be killed, and it's really amazing for me that Eliza, whom he had seen how the Lord God had sent the fire, 
that he had not thought that God can also protect him from Jezebel. So, but it's also passing to me also, what's also amazing here, was Jezebel could just have sent soldiers. But look at whom he, she had sent. She had sent a messenger. Maybe she was really trying to scare scare um, Elijah during the time. But then, you know, trouble came. And, um, you know, uh, this story reminded me of a quote from one of those who had mentored me. He is the chairman of the deacons of the church where I grew up in. My home church, First Baptist Church of Manila in Project 6 Quezon City. Right? And um, the um, Kuya Sam, as we finally called, called um, him, right? Engineer Samuel Sanglap. Right? And uh, he actually has a quote about this. Right? When you are when you are into different troubles. And here's the quote from him. And I borrow it today. He said this. The trouble with trouble is when you trouble to trouble the trouble, the trouble will trouble you. So don't trouble the trouble. Right? And that's so true. And there are times that we are seeing that you are in trouble. And there are so many times that when we don't react the proper way, the proper way, we are going to trouble the trouble. Now, right, and maybe right now you are you are so troubled because of the bleak future. We are already entering in a, uh, right now we are already expecting that this could have been done already. But the pandemic, right, it, right here in the United States is still growing. Right in other parts, you know, we, again, here in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, even though there's an uptick, right? Um, so we are still, like, looking into our, how about the kids getting to school, you know, next month will be the start of school and all that. Or maybe some of you don't have jobs yet, or the job that you are in right now, you don't like it, right? Some of you, your finances, the, your savings are already getting depleted, right? Some of you are, are you know, some of you might have, um, you know, health issues and all that. And um, here's actually really what's crazy. In the Philippines, you are again um, you are again subjected to um, MECQ because the cases are really growing, are going crazy. And right now in Southeast Asia, we had the most number of cases, even though the deaths until now is still low. But you know we are scared that sooner or later it will really grow. But here's the thing: why are these things happening? We thought that God is listening to our prayers and what's happening. And another thing that is a concern right now, um, for some of you here in the United States, there's a, uh, uh, there's a, what we call, there's what we call, um, you know, rent relief, right? Rent relief. But right now, that's already, right? The three, three months moratorium, right? It's already done. And so all of these things that are concerning us, so much trouble that we have. The title of the message today is got your six so where did we get that it is actually a military term right so um what's the meaning of that uh, actually you see this you know this is 12 o'clock this is um three o'clock this is six o'clock and this is nine uh, so that's the angle right so um this is your six the meaning of that is that i got your back right so um now in transitioning and again facing um, we are about to again like uh, go to conquest and go to conquer again our world. We had been, uh, we are ready to, to get into the world again, right? So we need, just like Elijah, after that he had won, right? He, the Lord God is telling him that God's got your back. I got your back. So that's our first point for today. God's got your back. In spite of all the troubles that you were saying. Right? In spite of the things that we are going through and the things that we are afraid of, the things that we are not sure of right in the future, here's actually the assurance that you and I have. Right? The Lord God is telling Elijah, I got you. I got your back. And in verse 5, then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, remember he ran away, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked and there, there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. Right, So he ate and drank and laid down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. Right? Listen here. God understands you. God understands your trouble. God even understands how troubled we are. 
And here's another thing. The Lord knows the solution to our troubles. If you're going to see here, Elijah was depressed. He was disappointed. He was discouraged, you know, and, and he was afraid. But the Lord also knew what was the solution to his problem. You know what the Lord God did? He told him to eat and then sleep, right? So he was hungry. He was, he was tired. So the Lord God made him eat. And he made him sleep and rest. And here's a point today that is so true all throughout. And we experience this time and time again. Where the Lord guides, he provides. Right? Um, there's a period in, in Elijah's life. That's why King Ahab was so angry at him. Because he was also the one who prophesied the drought and the famine in Israel. And during the time, Elijah was ministered to by, by birds, right? In the brook of Cherit. But it dried up eventually, and he had to go. And he had to go, and the Lord God used a widow, right? Who was actually just preparing their last meal. And Elijah was served by that widow, and eventually that widow had seen the provision of the Lord uh, through Elijah. And we had seen that all throughout Elijah's life, this is so true. And for you and me, I pray that you are going to understand that. And I pray that you're going to be confident in that, that God's got your back. When He guides you, He will provide for you. Right? And now, it says there, and if you look here, it says there, He arose and ate and drank, and He went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights. We know that it's not the food for 40 days and 40 nights. We know that it's not the food, but the Bible actually like said it there. But it is this. Right? It is this. I know. I don't know. Is there any energy drink that could actually sustain you for 40 days and 40 nights? Or there's like, you know, uh, you know, a power bar that is as strong as that. But we know that he went in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the power of God. The Bible actually says it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit. Right? And furthermore, in the New Testament, the Lord God says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When the Lord God Right, tells you to do something, he also gives you the power to be able to do it. Right? Now it's not according to our power, it's not according to our might, but it's according to the spirit, right? But by my spirit. Now in verse 9, when he got there to Horeb, and in verse 9, and there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Eliza? So he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. The Lord God allowed Elijah to vent out his frustrations. So Elijah did. He, vent out, he vented out his frustrations before the Lord. And it is how he perceive, perceived his situation. And what's clear here was his perception was wrong. Let's go on with the passage in verse 11. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore into the mountains and before broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. He had seen God's power. He had, he had seen God's protection. He, he had experienced God's provision. But he was out of focus. His eyes were looking at the wrong things. Nonetheless, the Lord listened. It was actually the Lord God who asked him, what are you doing here? If you're going to think about it, the Lord didn't have to listen. He didn't have to hear Elijah out. Why? God is all-knowing. He already knew anyway. Right? But he wanted Elijah to hear his own self. Right? He Because by his venting, he might hear how short-sighted and foolish his complaints were. And isn't that true for most of us? 
our tendency is when troubles come, when problems come our way, when we are so unsure of what's ahead of us, we complain. I don't know about you, but that's my nature. I complain a lot. But you know, the Lord God listens to us. Listens to us. And the Lord God listened to Elijah. But then when he's done venting out, when he's done complaining, that maybe, maybe, right, that he will be able to listen to God's voice. And listen here. The earthquake. You know, the strong wind, the earthquake, the fire. But the Lord was not there. And then he says, and after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? It's there again. And he said, again, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. I alone am left. And they seek to take my life. Is he really alone? He forgot God during this moment. He was out of focus. He was scared. And if you're going to think about it, he was scared of a woman. Well, today, the name of Jezebel is actually synonymous to somebody who is like, you know, a witch. Right? Somebody who is murderous. And the spirit of Jezebel actually is, a, you know, somehow it is associated with, with someone who is not listening to God. And there are times that we listen to different voices. Elijah, during this time, he heard the voice of Jezebel, but he was missing the voice of God. And there are times that we are like that. That will listen to the voices around us. The, the media, what we read, you know, what people who are scared, what they are saying. You even listen to your own voice. Elijah was listening to his own voice. But what was really clear, he was wrong. He was wrong. Because he was not alone. God was with him all throughout. Right? How easy it is for, for, for him to discount. What God had done all throughout his life, all throughout his ministry. And isn't that true for us too? It is easy to discount what God had done for us in the past. And listen here, you know, he went against, it is one against 450, right? And um, look here, you know, it was a, there's actually a saying that says, says it like, like this, God plus me, we're the majority, Right? He knew that God was with him, but he forgot that for a while. And isn't that also true when problems come? That's why the Lord God is telling us that the first thing that we need to do is to ask the Lord God. Right? When troubles come, the prayer should not be our last resort. It should be our first response to pray. To pray. Bring it to the Lord in prayer. Right? And here he said, I am alone. I'm the only one who's left. But that was not true. And in verse 15, then the Lord God said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael, right, as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. right, And Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Did you hear all this? It's like the Lord of the Rings. Right, that he was actually getting these kings together, but one that is actually worth, um, worth, um, worth, uh, uh, worth our attention is when the Lord God told him, "And you shall anoint Elisha, who will replace you." Right. So 
Now, why is that important? Later, we're going to explain it more. Then in verse 17, it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Can you imagine? The Lord God sent even those who are going to protect him. Right? Even someone is, he still needs to anoint. And here's another thing. Right? Whom the Lord directs, he protects. Right? In fulfilling the purpose of God for our lives, the Lord God sets things all right, for us. In the New Testament, the Lord God tells us that we are God's workmanship. We are God's masterpiece. Right? Created unto the Lord Jesus Christ, unto all good, good works in Christ Jesus. Right? And the Lord God had prepared for us these good works beforehand. Right? The Lord God is telling us here. Right? So, when the Lord God directs us, He will protect us. But here's the thing. Right? The Lord God... If you're going to think about it, all the apostles, except for John, right, actually died in the hands of people, of other people. They, some of them died a really violent death. But how come you said that uh, you are going to be protected? You know, and um, again, that protection of the Lord God is according to God's purpose. But when the, this, this men, when we finally see them in heaven... They will love to tell you the story of how the Lord God has sustained them, right? In the, in the early church, they were persecuted. Nero burned Rome and was blamed on them. And there's so many stories of, of you know, people who were being killed, who were being offered, who were being burned. But all of them, there's a lot of story about these people who are actually dying in peace. And some of them even singing, singing hymns to the Lord. Right? And that's amazing. Even in death, right? it's not that the Lord God did not protect them, but the Lord God worked miraculously even in their deaths. And here's another thing that we have to understand. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of of the earth what does it have to do with with Elijah because here it is when you follow God's direction you're assured of God's protection provision and promotion right when you follow God's direction the Lord God opens for you an avenue you are actually being put in a realm that is not just you know this this one there's a parallel one that we it's not natural the Bible actually tells us that we are in a different realm, right? Some of you might call that the supernatural realm. And the Lord God is telling us, remember what He said, and when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be, you shall receive power, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Again, when you follow God's direction, you're assured of God's protection, provision, and promotion. And here it is, right? And um, maybe you're saying, oh, Pastor, I'm already, I'm already experiencing that. But when you start to become a witness, tell you, you are going to understand there's a lot more that the Lord God has in store for you. God's protection that you're experiencing now, right? Is a, you know, I remember, how, how can I describe this? You remember when we were growing up in the Philippines, there's a common joke that we say, Walayan sa lolo ko, right? You have nothing against, uh, you have nothing on my grandfather, right? Or my grandmother. We have those jokes, right? And it's the same thing right now. What you're experiencing now, the provision, the power, the empowerment of the Lord God, the protection, and whatever you are seeing now, and you have not been a witness yet for the Lord, right? There's nothing yet that you had experienced, right? And those who are following God's direction, the Lord God opens up for you avenues that you couldn't even explain, right? If your Christian life right now is becoming stale, right? If your Christian life does not bring you anywhere and there's no joy, right? Here it is. It's not because of the pandemic. Try, right? Start being or becoming a witness, right? And that's the Lord God is telling you are going to experience all that. His protection, His provision, and even His promotion. That leads us, right, in verse 18. The Lord God told Elijah, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel. 
all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. So leads us to the next point. God's got you your backup. Right? First thing, God's got your back. Now, God's got you your backup. Right? The Lord God made you to be part of his team. You are never alone when God's with you. And there are others in God's army. There are others in God's team. And some of them were designated by the Lord to work closely together with you. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 14, Therefore the king of Syria sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, Elisha said, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Right? And he was thinking he was with us. We we're alone here. And in verse 17 it says, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord God opened the eyes of the servant of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Right? The Lord surrounds us. There are things, there are things that more than meets the eye. Are you getting overwhelmed? Do you feel that you are alone? It's not true. God is with you. But not only that. In Hebrews 11, I mean Hebrews 1.13. Who are these? The Bible says in Hebrews 1.13. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. This is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says about the angels in verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Did you hear that? Angels are actually ministering to us, to those who are heirs of salvation. Now, Elisha, the chariots of fire, the ministering angels, well, both Elijah and Elisha had their squad of prophets. In the New Testament, the Lord introduced the ecclesia, or in other words, the church, the called out ones from darkness into God's marvelous, marvelous light. So today, that's your squad, your church. In like us, we actually, we actually uh, broke it down further. We have what we call our small groups, which we call cell groups, and that's actually our squad too. Now, in Acts chapter two, verse forty-four, look at how it happened in the early church. Now, all who believed were together and had all things in common. In verse forty-five, it says, "And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need." Did you hear that? Right. So everyone, everyone's got everyone's backs. Right. They are actually they they got their six. If you're thinking about it, right. So the church should be we who are together in church should be telling. You know, we are able to tell not only with words but by our actions. We got your six. Right? The Lord God sent us to be part of a local church because they are actually our backup. We back up one another. And look, right in the next one it says, So continuing, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Now, in verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Right? Dedicated to apostles' teaching, to prayers, to the breaking of bread, to fellowship. Right? For those who do not know, like us actually hosts an everyday um, prayer dawn. Right? So uh, that's uh, we have it live streamed. That's every Monday to Friday at 5 a.m. Yes, right, 5 a.m. here in New York. And, um, you know, and uh, I hope that um, if you haven't um, attended yet, if you haven't joined us yet, so join us. Join us. So this Monday to Friday at 5 a.m. Well, in the Philippines, it's 5 p.m. We actually have, a, you know, people who are um, joining us from the Philippines. There's one who's in, in Bahrain. Uh, there are people in the Middle East. There are people in Southeast Asia. 
from time to time we have people in Australia and also in Italy, right? And um, and last Friday, right on Fridays rather we have what we call faith news. And last Friday we featured Pastor Paul Dignadise and his wife Anne, right from Coron Palawan, and um, you know they had a great story. They had a, a you know, they had a big emergency two years ago, and we talked about that. And here's actually the great part of that testimony. You know, because the church, the Ecclesia, got together. Actually, the name of their church is JYF, Jesus Young Followers um, Ecclesia. And you know how the, the Ecclesia had come together, had come together and raised the needed money, the needed money for Anne's hospitalization. And then they had to raise uh, 3 million pesos, all right, 3 million pesos. And they are in an island. They are in Coron. Right, not they, Pastor Paul. You know, if you know this guy, would always like you know he's somebody who would really spend everything that he has for the ministry, right? And in the in their testimony, they have talked about it, and we are going to we are going to uh, we're going to reshare that right today. So after this, that you can watch the testimony, and I pray that you're going to be blessed by their testimony, and then you can actually you can actually share it too, right? So he, they actually their first letter after this newsletter they titled it god's excellencies unveiled god's ecclesia united well we praise the lord god for that you know now another thing that the lord god is telling us right the backup the backup is god himself the lord god himself where do we see that in first john chapter 4 verse 4 and it says here you are of god little children or the meaning of that my my children right or uh, in Filipino, the way we call iho, iha, right? And have overcome them, right? And because greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. And do you know that there's actually a great connection between 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, and in Acts chapter 2? How? Here it is, all right? So uh, it, I'm reminded of this song, that we sang um, it. Uh, that we sang it um, often when I was in Bible school. I was part of the quartet in um, Word of Life um, Biblical Leadership Institute, right? And so, um, actually, one of those uh, in the in that quartet is Pastor Paul's brother, Pastor Ruel Dignadise, right? And um, we always sing the song, "Greater is He that is in Me." And look at what it says there in the second verse. It says, On the day of Pentecost, a rushing mighty wind blew into the upper room, baptized all of them with a power greater than any earthly foe. And I'm so glad I've got it too. I'm going to let the whole world know. Right? And the Lord God says, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Amen. Right? And... The difference in the Old Testament and in the New Testament is because in the Old Testament, there's no indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Right? It takes a whole, a whole sermon in order for us to understand that. But I'm going to give you a snippet of what's the meaning of indwelling. In John chapter 14, verse 17, the Lord Jesus Christ was talking to the apostles the night that he was going to be betrayed. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. And then Jesus said to the apostles, But you know him. For he dwells with you. And look at this next part. And will be in you. During this time, the Holy Spirit was still promised. And the Lord Jesus Christ actually said here, He will be in you. Brings us back to Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And when the Holy Spirit is come, you shall receive power and you will be my witnesses. Now the Lord God is telling you that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So how can I have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside me? Here it is. Right? Again, of course we know that we've been talking about that. That the Lord Jesus Christ is inside you. God the Father is also inside you. But the one who's really operating in you right now is the Holy Spirit. Do you want a life that is assured of His presence, of His power, of His provision, and everything, of His promises? Well, you need to ask the Lord to be inside you 
So how do I do that? Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. I know for those of you who have been with us for quite a while, you're already familiar with this verse. The Lord Jesus Christ was talking here and he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And then he says, If any man hears my voice and opens the door, and look at what was the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ there, I will come into him. And so what is he talking about? That he's talking about your life. About your life. Right? The Lord said that God's got your back. And he also had, you know, God's got you your back up, right? But the thing there is that the Lord God that made us part of a church, that's our team. But here's the thing, right? Not because you heard this, not because you are going to church, that you're already really part of God's team. The Lord God says that you need to be in Christ. And Christ got to be in you. So how do we do that? Now, the Lord Jesus Christ said, If any man hears my voice and opens the door, then I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. I will dine with him and I will, I will eat with him, right? And he with me. What's the meaning of that? Because, you know, what the Lord God is after is not a religion. Right? What he is after is a relationship. In the, during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, they just don't eat with anybody. Right In a table, they need to have a relationship with those who are on that table, around the table. And today, may I ask you, right, would you want to be part of that table? Right? The thing that the Lord God wants us to do right, is to open your heart. Right? Repent of your sins and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So I'm going to be closing in prayer. And I would invite you if you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, I would invite you to follow me in prayer. It's not my prayer that is going to save you. It is the grace of God that you are now receiving, right, by faith. You got to believe. You got to believe in what God said. Again, our message, got your six. God's got your back, right? And not only that, that the Lord God is with you, right? The Lord God also wants to be in you. And of course, part of that, that he has part you to be, that he has taken you to be part of a team. Right? God's got your backup for you. And that's the church. And again, I would like to invite you, if you are not part of a church yet, right? we would love to welcome you to be part of Like Us Church International. And that's our message for today. Got your six in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you. Lord God, for your promise, Lord God, that you got our backs. For your promise, Lord God, that whoever, Lord God, receives the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are going, Lord, to become your children, Lord God. Give them the authority to become children of God. Lord God, those who believe in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And thank you, Lord God, Lord, for we know, Lord God, that you speak in still, small voice. Right now, Lord God, I pray that you're going to speak to those, Lord, who are not saved yet. Those who do not have any relationship with you yet. And I come to you, Lord God. Lord, again, we know that you are working in people's lives. Thank you, Lord God, for allowing us, Lord God, to come to know you. And I pray, Lord God, that those who don't, that today is the day of salvation for them. Right, for those who are now watching, for those who are joined us in today's service. And right now, that there's this, the Lord God had been speaking to you, but right now, you knew that the message is for you. And that's the still, small voice of God talking to you. That is the Lord Jesus Christ knocking at the door of your heart. Now my question is, will you open the door? Will you listen to the voice of God? Today is inviting you. He's inviting you to believe in Him. Know that He's got you. He's got your back. So if you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, right, follow me in this prayer. Again, follow me. Right, The Bible says that with belief in the heart and with mouth confession is turned unto salvation. So today, I ask you to pray loudly with me. Right? Confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ 
has risen from the dead. Let's pray. If you want to, again, receive the Lord Jesus Christ, follow me in this prayer. Lord God, thank you for loving me. Thank you, Lord, that you got my back. Lord, I come to you and I confess that I had sinned against you. Please forgive me for all the sins that I had done against you. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for dying for me on the cross of Calvary. Thank you that you shed your blood to wash away all my sins. And I now come to you and I ask you, Lord, to come into my heart, to come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. You will be my boss, my master, my king, my God, my Lord, my rescuer, my Savior from here on till eternity. Thank you, Lord, for your promise that I now have eternal life. Thank you, Lord, Thank you, Lord, that all throughout, that all throughout you, got you got my back. And now entrust everything, Lord, into your hands. In the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the people of God say, Amen. 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 Again, that's a, a thank you for being with us today. So again, for those who have not done it yet, like, comment, heart on heart, share. And again, this is Pastor Ronald Ramirez from Lightcast Church International here in New York City. God bless you.